Okay, actually, this is going to work. So let's do it. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Um, pleasure. So I just wanted to start off um, asking you about um, how you grew up. I know you grew up in Albany, Georgia, um, and you started off with playing in church. Um, and then I also heard that you've credited John Collins as a mentor for you over the years. Um, and that was someone who showed you the ropes of solo guitar playing. Um, do you feel like you had a concept for solo guitar playing at a young age? And if you could expand on that, like what you were listening to in high school and um, yeah, your growth during that time and maybe how you segued to moving to New York. Okay, there's, that's quite a few questions that you threw at me, but I'll answer them the best uh, to you. the best of my ability. <laughs> okay. Well, when you're young, I don't think no one has a conception of anything when you're when you're that young. I started playing the guitar at the age of five. That's when I first saw the instrument, and that's when I knew that. Uh, because first of all, I'd always had a love of music uh, because I was listening to everything, uh, all kinds of well, you know, the things that my mother was playing around the house. She was playing a lot of gospel music. And I heard some, I heard a few things on the radio. You hear things, little melodies on TV that resonate with you. But there was one day I went to church and um, I saw a gentleman, well, I saw the instrument before I saw someone play it. I saw the instrument first. Mm -hmm. And I thought that, uh, wow, that's a very peculiar looking object. And I uh, remember seeing it perched up against one of the church pews and there was a, a cable which extended from the input over into this box, which I found out later that that was the amplifier. And I just, you know, I was like, wow, that's really peculiar looking, very interesting looking. And then the guy, this gentleman started to play the instrument. And as soon as I heard it, I knew that whatever feelings uh, I was feeling musically, that instrument, that odd looking instrument was going to be the vehicle that I would be using to express whatever musical feelings I was I was feeling. But uh, prior to seeing that, I remember going to church and there were people singing. People would always be singing and clapping their hands and rejoicing. And, you know, the music wasn't very sophisticated, but it was very moving. Uh, you would see you would get a group of these old ladies singing these songs. They would be singing these songs and it was so powerful. It was like they were channeling the ancestors and you would see men, I'm talking about big, strong, burly men who were, who would be moved to tears when they heard that. And I always thought that that was such a powerful thing. And even at that age, at the age of four or five years old, I was aware of how music touched people on a deep and emotional level. You know, when somebody, when you're playing your guitar or singing or whatever, when somebody cries or claps their hands or just react a certain way, that's, you know, that's, I, that's really, that's some really powerful stuff. You know, you may, you can connect with strangers in that fashion. You may not know anything about that person on a personal level, but for some strange reason, it seems like you know everything about them. And they know about you too, because you're exposing yourself uh, through the music. You're exposing your feelings through the music. So, uh, so my mother, being the very perceptive lady that she is, because she's still alive, so I mentioned her in the present tense. She came home from, she, she bought me a guitar. She came home from the supermarket one day <laughs> And she had uh, a bag. You know how it is when you were a little kid, when your mother came home <laughs> from, sh from you know shopping with a bag. The first thing you want to know is, well, hey, mom, did you get me anything? You remember those days? Yeah. So she uh, went into the kitchen. I followed her into the kitchen. She laid everything on the table. And I'm like, really? Hey, mom, what you got for me? What you got for me? And she pulled out this little guitar. Uh, You've probably read the story of me telling, talking about this little plastic green guitar with these little red strings on it. 
and um, she, we took it out of the box and she gave it to me. And I had no conception of music, I had no idea how to play it. The only thing that I had to go on was what I had seen this gentleman in the church do or what I'd seen people on television do playing guitar. And I remember putting the guitar in my hands, didn't tune it because I had no idea how to tune it. But I put it in my hands and held it up to my chest because, you know, when you play the guitar, it's you, you, you hold it up against your abdominal area or the torso and you play it and you feel these vibrations from the instrument coming through your body. And I remember feeling that when I strummed the instrument, mm -hmm. it may not have sounded good to everybody else, but it sure as heck sounded good to me because as far as I was concerned, I was making music, yeah. you know? And, and to this day, Allison, when I play my guitar and I've been playing for over 50 years, I'll be 60 years old this year. I've been playing for about 55 years now. It doesn't even sound right, <laughs> but it's the truth. Mm -hmm. So I still get that same feeling, that same energy today when I pick up my guitar. Mm -hmm. So um, you ask me- George Benson had that too. He, um, what was it? He, did he make his first guitar? Actually, George's stepfather, because George started out on ukulele. Yeah. That was his first instrument, but uh, his stepfather was a Charlie Christian fan. And- oh. I don't know if you knew that or not. You probably oh, read about it. Yeah. I, read the, I read the biography too. For some reason, I don't remember that. But. Yeah, well, it's a very good biography. Yeah. But the, uh, his stepfather, who was a Charlie Christian fan and, and played a little bit of guitar himself, uh, I think he and George had gone somewhere to look at some electric guitars. And the stepfather was a bit of a tinkerer. He saw it, looked at the mechanisms of it. He said, hey, man, I can make this for you. So... He made George Benson's first guitar out of a dresser or hope chest, whatever you call oh, those things. Okay. Yeah. And he uh, figured out how to electrify it. And that was George's first guitar. Oh, okay. Well, what was your, after that guitar, what was your first guitar? Well, after that guitar, uh, my mother, I don't know if you remember this brand name. You may be too young to remember this, but there used to be a brand name. Uh, of guitars back in the 60s and 70s called Tysco, T-E-I-S-K-O, Tysco Del Rey. And that was the first guitar that she, uh, the first electric guitar that she and my dad bought me. And uh, so I eventually, well, let me just get back to, uh, mm -hmm. but, but I don't wanna move too far, go too far too <laughs> fast. So back to what I was talking about, about playing the guitar, you know, trying to play the guitar. I uh, was, you know, I must've driven my, my mom and dad crazy because I was just going around the house, just banging on this thing, banging on this instrument. But as far as I'm concerned, I was making music, had no concept of anything, but I was making music it's in my little mind. So, and I would um, go to church and, 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 and sit on the front row and watch these gentlemen play the guitar, this gentleman play the guitar. So one of the ladies in my church, and I'm still in touch with her today, her name is Ida Mae Baker. She also played guitar. She was a great singer, uh, played the piano, played just about everything. She came over to my house, our house one day, and she tuned my guitar, but not in the regular Spanish tuning. She tuned it, uh, she used the open D tuning, which is uh, just a regular, e, a regular D major chord. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you, being a guitar player yourself, you may have experimented with that particular yeah. tuning. But uh, so when I took the guitar back from her and I played, I played it, I'm like, wow, this is pretty hip. So I just, you know, I, I started to make up little tunes in my head, little rhythms or whatever. And then there was a, uh, another guy in my church who um, his name was J.B. Allen. We used to call him Catfish. He's gone now. He died about maybe five or six years ago. But he was the one who showed me how to uh, show me the regular conventional Spanish tuning that has become accepted all um, universally. So, and then he showed me how to play a couple of chords. And then I always had pretty good ears. I could pick up things on the records. And uh, once again, you know, watching the people in church. So, I, you know, 
I got good enough to play in the church. When I was about six or seven years old, I, I was eventually playing for the church. But then I uh, was always, always uh, keeping my ears on other types of uh, music that was being played on the guitar. Because anything that had anything to do with the guitar, I was all ears. I used to watch, uh, there used to be a show called Hee Haw. You may not remember that one. How old are you, if you don't mind me asking, Allison? I turned 32 today. Okay, you're, you're the same age as my children. Oh. I have a 30-year-old daughter and a 35-year-old son. But um, TV used to be a lot different. It was a lot hipper than it is now because back then, growing up in the 60s and 70s, you could actually see people on television shows playing instruments, television programs playing instruments. Uh, you don't see much of that now. I mean, I'm talking about the level of musicianship was very high. Uh, country music, there was a guy named Glenn Campbell. You know that name? He used to have a show called the Glenn Campbell Good Time Hour. And I remember watching that television show and I was just so amazed at the level of musicianship that uh, was coming from this man. And then there was also a show called Hee Haw. You know that show? No. I uh -huh, got you. <laughs> which, uh, had uh, had uh, Buck Owens and Roy Clark. You know that name? No, I don't. Oh, great. I mean, it's country music, but great. Write, these, write that name down, Roy Clark. Write that name down. And I was just totally amazed by what I was hearing. And I tried to play like that. You know, I, uh, I still go back to Roy Clark and those guys every now and then now just for inspiration. And how old were you when that? I was like five, like six or seven years old. Okay. I was, I was, I was, I was very young. Yeah. Yeah. And then I remember seeing B.B. King. I know you know who that is. Uh, I saw him on a television show called Sanford and Son. Uh, you ever hear of that television show? Mm -hmm. With Red Fox and Demond Wilson, LaWanda Page. Yeah. It's, I, it, 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 it's running, they, they run a lot of reruns now on television and I watch it. In fact, I bought this, the, the uh, DVD box set of that show because I loved it so much. Okay. But uh, seeing B.B. King was really a wonderful experience for me because what he played, I never heard anybody play the guitar like that. I mean, the tone, the yeah. sound that he got, that stinging, biting tone, it, that stinging, biting tone, it sounded like it felt like a flame was coming through every note that he played. And then when he started to sing, that resonated with me just like that because B.B. King sounded like he was preaching to you when he sang. It was very similar to the way that the, uh, my pastor in the church would deliver a sermon. So uh, I fell in love with B.B. King immediately. And uh, you mentioned George Benson. I saw George Benson, the first time I saw him, was when I was 12 years old, uh, back in 1975. It was on a school night when I should have been in bed. It was, it was like around nine or 10 o'clock. And I was up flicking the channels. So I came across channel 13, which was the PBS station. Um, and I see this guy sitting on a bar stool and he was playing a fat body guitar, which I'd never seen before. I found out later on that it was a Gibson Johnny Smith guitar, the same one that he played on that recording, Breezing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I had to buy myself one of those later on. As soon as I started making some money, I bought me one. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was playing some of the most incredible things. I never heard anybody play the guitar quite like that before. And, and Allison, when I heard that, it let me know that that was a whole other level of excellency to aspire to. So I made a mental note of his name. And oh, by the way, the rest of the guys in the band, it was Biddy Goodman on clarinet, Papa Joe Jones on drums, Milt Hinton on bass, Ooh. Teddy Wilson on the piano, Red Norville on vibes. Oh. And uh, and Teddy Wilson, did I say Teddy Wilson? Yeah. He was playing piano. And man, it messed it messed me up. You know, you can actually find that clip on YouTube if you haven't already seen it. I think I might have. Um, if you haven't, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you later on. Thank you. 
I like, I, I like turning people on to things that uh, new, new information that they aren't co uh, quite familiar with. Yeah. But when I saw that, I was like, whoa, I'm ruined for life. That's what made me want to play jazz music. Mm -hmm. That, and oh, I have to um, mention this too. I came across this later on, uh, actually before. Uh, you remember Mr. Rogers Neighborhood? Mm -hmm. That was some of the first jazz I heard, but I had no idea that I was listening to jazz. I just liked the sound. That piano player, Johnny Costa, great piano player, man. And I found out later on as I became more uh, educated about this music, I found out later on that he was a disciple of Art Tatum. Mm. And then the guitar player on there, uh, Joe Negri, I came across him later on. Uh, but anyway, so, I was 12 years old when I heard George and I made a mental note of who he was. And at the time I had a job raking leaves in my neighborhood. I used to carry me and one of my buddies, we used to carry a little red wagon with uh, our uh, lawn bags and our rakes. And we walk around the neighborhood and we rake leaves. Mm -hmm. And you know, you'd, um, rake somebody's yard for like maybe five dollars and you split we you know we say, say we, we we made we, we rake like uh five yards for five four yards for five dollars and we split 10 bucks you know <laughs> split it down the middle you know back then you know for a for, for a 10 for a 12 year old kid that's a lot of money yeah. so i remember taking that money that i made with the leaves I bought my first pair of Converse All Star sneakers. You could get those. You remember those sneakers? They were I very popular back then. Awesome, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you know, you, you, I bought my first pair of Converse All Star sneakers, and I started my record collection with that money. And the first two records that I bought was uh, the George Vincent Cookbook, yep. and it's Uptown. Yep. And I would take those. I took those records home unwrapped them, put them on the turntable and sat next to the turntable with my guitar and just tried to pick up everything that I could off those records. You know, because back then we weren't able, the technology wasn't as uh, advanced then as it is now. So you had, you really had to use your ears. People are very blessed nowadays because you can, your generation can acquire information more easily than we did. So I had to sit down next to that record with my guitar and just, you know, try to hack away and get it as close to what I heard as possible. Yeah. So it was very, uh, it was a laborious endeavor, but it was very good for my ears. It was very good for the ears. And plus another thing too, uh, I was watch, I was reading the liner notes. That's why I'm, I love LPs because they're so present. And I remember, uh, sitting down, reading the LPs and just looking at the pictures and just fantasizing about what I'd like to do, how I'd like to do that one day, what 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 they were doing. And then I came across names like Charlie Christian. I remember reading that George was highly influenced by Ch Charlie Christian. So I went out and bought Charlie Christian records. I bought records by Barney Kessel, because uh, Charlie Christian was a big influence on those guys. He was a big influence on Charlie, on, 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 uh, Charlie Christian, was a big influence on Barney Kessel, Herb Ellis, Tal Farlow. I bought records about all of those guys. And I also came across names like Miles Davis, Coleman Hawkins, people who didn't play the guitar, Art Tatum, Lester Young, Coleman Hawkins. I went out and bought records by those guys. And then one of the guys in my church, a guy named brother butch claude who just died a couple of years ago i was in touch with him until until the very end too he was uh he heard me in church one day and so he came up to me afterwards he said hey you like jazz guitar don't you i said how'd you know and i got a little nervous because that's not the kind of stuff that you're supposed to be playing in church <laughs> you know what i mean so i thought he was going to give me a a, a a a good scolding but he said well listen you sound good Come by my house after school one day. I wanna, I wanna share some music with you. So I went by his house, and he had some George Benson records that I had not heard, like um, uh, Bad Benson, Beyond the Blue Horizon. He played those records for me. Then 
he played two other records for me. The first one was Smoking at the Half Note. Smoking at the Half Note and Boss Guitar. And I was like, oh man, I'm done. And he gave me those two records. He gave me those two LPs. So uh, that's how it, that's how it started. Beautiful. And then, so through high school, you, did you have a mentor then? And then in high school, in high school, that, I mean, there weren't any jazz guitar players down. I mean, there were some great, some good guitar players yeah. down in Albany, Georgia. But uh, as far as jazz goes, there weren't any jazz players, but I didn't care because I was just, I love music so much. I didn't care whether you play blues, jazz or whatever. If you were doing something that was that I wasn't doing, I wanted to figure out how to do it. If you did something a little better than, because there's always somebody who can do something a little better than you. And I was just, you know, I was hungry for, for the knowledge. And uh, I had some good people around me who encouraged me to, to strive for excellence. But now I had to get out of Albany at one time. At, at some point, it, it, I had to get out of there because what I was aspiring to do, um, I couldn't do it there. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I did get a gig in high school, after I graduated high school at a place called the House of Jazz. There was a guy who uh, was an organ player and I ended up working with him. But in the first time I met him, I was, I was in high school, I was working at a shoe store selling shoes. It was my little part-time job after school, you know, working at Jay's shoe store. I'm like 17, 16, 16, 17 years old. So um, this guy came in and I knew just from looking at him from the first glance that he wasn't, he wasn't from Albany, Georgia. He was from somewhere else. And so I said, well, may I help you, sir? And he talked real fast. He didn't talk like one of the, like, like the players from, like the, like the people from down in Albany, Georgia. And he said, well, I need a pair of comfortable shoes because I need something comfortable while I'm playing that organ at night. And it, the light bulb went off. I said, you play organ? He said, yeah, I play organ. I said, where are you playing? He said, I'm playing at a place called the House of Jazz. I said, really? Okay. So uh, we got into a, we had a brief discussion about organ and I mentioned that I was a Jimmy Smith fan. He said, oh yeah, I knew, I know Jimmy Smith. I said, you know Jimmy Smith? He said, yeah. So I said, okay. So I sold him his shoes. A few months later, I went by the club, had no business in there because I was underage. And I sat in and played, everybody was cool, you know, did the best I could. I remember we played Billy's Bounce and we played a couple of other R&B tunes and you know, I, I, I handled myself okay for a 16, 17 year old. But the club owner, uh, Mr. Billy Nobles, he told me, he said, son, I like the way you play, but you can't be in here, you're too young. Come back in a couple of years when you're, about, when you're at least 18 come back. So, uh, because he was concerned about uh, losing his license, you know, having a minor in a club. I was a minor, I had no business in there. But I mean, when you're that age, you're not afraid of anything, you know? So, uh, so I left, came back after I graduated high school, sat in on, it was on a Thursday night and uh, I ended up getting the gig. I got hired the next night to play in that club. And I didn't have an amplifier. The club, the uh, the club owner and his wife, they uh, loaned me eighty dollars to go to a pawn shop and buy an amplifier because I didn't, you know, I wasn't didn't, didn't have a whole lot of money. So they bought me an amplifier, and uh, I'm still in touch with that lady today. Her, the, the husband, he's gone, but I was in touch with him until he died. But I'm still in touch with the wife today. They see, they always looked at me as their son, you know. So. Um, where was I? Oh yeah, so I ended up playing at the club and got a lot of experience playing um, playing for a different audience other than the audience in my church. And uh, I got a lot of flack from the church because of that. Because, you know, people in these small towns, they mean well, but they have not, they don't really know any better. Mm -hmm. They haven't seen the world. So anybody that because I was like the, like the baby that everybody looked out for and they didn't want to see, I guess they were genuinely concerned about me getting on drugs or, and, yeah. and th that kind of thing, which never happened because I had some people who were hanging out in the, in the, in the, in the clubs that uh, always looked out for me. Mm -hmm. You know, they, I, had some, I had some guardian angels 
Yeah, because there were situations that I've been in that where I should not have been here. I shouldn't be here. But I think uh, through the concern and genuine uh, love of those people, nothing, nothing, nothing seriously bad happened to me. So I'm thankful for that. Thank you, God. Um, I'm going to jump a little bit. Um, can you talk about how you were signed uh, to Columbia Records in the 90s and um, maybe what was going on with the Young Lions? And is that kind of how you met Roy Hargrove? Well, I met Roy Hargrove after that. But, but now before that, um, I was, um, well, I, I, I just want to backtrack just a little bit. Mm -hmm. I left Albany, Georgia in uh, 1983 and moved to Houston, Texas. Oh, gotcha. And I, I left and went on the road with that organ player I was telling you about. And uh, it was really an interesting experience because the guy that brought us out to Houston, he promised us that we were gonna be making all of this money and we were gonna be uh, having our, we're gonna have our own hotel, our own apartments and everything. So when I got there, I found out that there was no gig. We had to go out and audition for a gig and play for the door. That was, you know, it was, you know, it was a, he was a real jive dude. And uh, none of us had our own apartment. It was, it was three adults. It was me, it was actually four adults. Me, the drummer, the organ player, and his lady. We go into this apartment and I'm like, wait a minute. Something doesn't seem quite right here. So my survival instincts kicked in and I immediately put my suitcase on the couch. I said, I'm gonna be sleeping here. <laughs> so that's <laughs> where I slept. The, the, uh, the drummer, he ended up sleeping in a, in, a, in a recliner and the organ player and his lady, they ended up getting the bedroom. It was a one bedroom apartment with one bathroom. Oh. But I didn't care because I was out of Albany, Georgia and I figured, hey, you know, I'm a young man. I'm like 19 years old at the time. If you're gonna do this, do it while you're young with no responsibilities. Because mm -hmm. I wasn't a father, I wasn't married at the time. So, but anyway, I, I, I Got a lot of experience playing in clubs, learn how to work, how to how to read the room, learn how to be versatile because it wasn't that we we played some jazz, but we played mostly R and B and funk and rhythm and blues, which you know, I love that kind of stuff. I'm not one of those two, one of those jazz musicians who's too high and mighty to get down with the blues. I love the blues and I love that other stuff, man. So anyway, I stayed in Houston, Texas for about a little under a year. Then I went to Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, I moved there and I met a lot of really wonderful musicians. Uh, a lot of the local musicians like Mose Davis, Dan, you, you, probably, you probably never heard of any of these musicians. Mose Davis, Danny Harper. I think Renard was still there at the time because he's from Georgia. Oh, okay. Renard Harper, mm -hmm. you know Renard, mm -hmm. fantastic drummer. So um, I met a lot of wonderful musicians in, in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, I met Jimmy Smith there back in the in the mid '80s, and I ended up sitting in with him and ended up getting a gig with him uh, about a year or so later. About the, I, in fact, he hired me that same year, in 19 well the next year. I met him in '87. He hired me in '88. So meeting him and and uh, being on the road with him allowed me a chance to move around, see some other parts of the world, and meet some other musicians. So. Uh, I'm leading up to your question about getting signed to Columbia. So back in 1980, I think it was 86, uh, I'm playing at a place in Atlanta, Georgia called Walter Mitty's. And this particular night, Brantford Marcellus, Kenny Kirkland, and Daryl Jones, they were in town doing a gig with Sting. And they came into the club that night while I was playing. And, they, and I was so excited to meet them because Brantford, even to this day, 40, almost 40 years later, he's still a hero of mine. We're not too much, we're not that far in age, but I, you know, I look up to him. I love that man. And he's still someone that I just, you know. And uh, so they sat in 
and after we finished playing, you know, they were very complimentary and just very friendly, nice, down to earth guys. And um, Branford said to me, he said, well, when are you gonna come to New York? You, you know, you need to be in New York. I said, well, that's, that's on my radar. So uh, then that same year, I'm sorry, it was 85, not 86, it was 1985. So that same year, John Hicks, you know that name? Mm -hmm. Wonderful pianist. He came in to that club that I was playing because see, John had family down in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. So he was there visiting some of his folks. So he came and sat in. And I remember we played the tune Green Dolphin Street, which is a song that I do not like. I do not like that tune, but for some reason, the way John Hicks played it, he made me like it that night. So um, we played and we talked. And then um, he said, you need to come to New York. So once again, all that idea away. And then a few months later that same year, I went to New York and uh, went and sat in at some of the jam sessions and uh, Branford gave me some ideas. I mean, some names of some people to call and some people to check out and some people and some places to go. So I remember going to the Vanguard, seeing Cedar Walton with Billy Higgins. Uh, that was an incredible experience seeing that. And so uh, I would take trips to New York just to get that surge, to get that, that get my battery charged. So back in 1989, I was, uh, I heard that Harry Connick was going to be playing in town. So I went to the concert, bought a ticket, and I recognized the bass player. You know Ben Wolf? Yeah. Yeah, Ben was one of the first musicians that I played with when I got to New York. Uh, when I, my first trip, him and, Re and Rini Rodness and Rodney Kendrick, Justin Robinson, those are the guys that I would hang out with when I would come here. Mm -hmm. So um, after Harry finished his concert, I recognized Ben. And so Harry came out and this, I mean, this is before he had really became this mega star that he is now. He was, uh, that movie when Harry met Sally had just come out. So he was touring and working that recording, the soundtrack. So um, I talked to Ben and we got, we, we, we got reacquainted with each other. So um, he said, hey man, Harry's putting together a big man and he's looking for a guitar player. And we told him about you. He said, I said, what? You told him about me? He said, yeah. And then Harry uh, came over, ben, ben introduced me to Harry. He said, man, I'm hearing good things about you. So he said, I want to hear you play. I said, well, there's a jam session going on at this place called Sounds of Buckhead. Um, let's just go by and hang out, have a good time. So he came by, we played, we played Just Friends. And then Harry got up and sang. And then he, uh, we went out on the balcony of the club and we had a talk. And Harry's got this way, very personable and, and engaging guy. And he has this way of just looking at looking you straight in the eye and talking to you, just really connecting to you, you know, man to man, human to human, person to person. And we sat up, we stood up there on that patio of that club and talked for about a half hour. And I said, okay, this, I, I can do this. I can do this. Yeah, this might be a fun opportunity. And at the time I was playing with Jimmy Smith and, uh, I gave Jimmy Smith my notice. He, did, he, wasn't, he didn't take it too kindly because he fired me after that. But anyway, I said, well, everything must change. Yeah. But uh, I stayed in Harry's band for about four years. And he was a very, very giving and very supportive guy. He was the one who got me that deal with Columbia Records. That's how I got signed. Had it not been for him, I don't think I would have gotten signed. But Harry would do this thing where he did this, not just for me, but for a couple of other musicians too, in order for us to, to get our name out there. About 20 minutes, maybe a half hour before showtime, he would allow me to open the show for him with just my guitar. I'd play and I'd sing, you know, well, I try to sing anyway. <laughs> I'm not a good singer. But I did the best I could. But you know that little gesture was well, not not a little gesture because you know for him to do that was very, very significant move on his part. 
because it helped me out tremendously. And uh, he went to uh, Tommy Matola, who was the CEO of the record company at that time, and told them, you know, this guy, you know, I think you guys should give him a shot. And that's how I got signed. And I would never forget Harry for that. And I tell him all the time, if you ever need me for anything, I'm there for you. Because he did not have to do that. So that's how I got signed. And I have to uh, give Branford Marcellus a little credit too, some credit too, because he was also, we were all on the same label at the time, me, Harry Connick, Branford Marcellus. Whenever Branford, uh, he, he did this record called, uh, I Heard You Twice the First Time. It was just uh, his blues record. And I, uh, he invited me to play on it. And he also invited me to come out and do concerts with him. So those guys, those two guys were really, um, really helpful, me, helpful to me in the early stages of my career. So that's how I got signed with Columbia Records. Okay. I thought maybe, um, what was I gonna say? Oh, what I was gonna go to was like how you met Ray Hargrove. Okay, I met Roy in Bradley's. You might've heard people talk about Bradley's. That place was incredible, man. And I would see Roy, this was back in the, uh, oh Jesus. I met Roy in the late eighties, I think like 89, 90, but I ran into him in Bradley's. I would go in there whenever I was in New York and just to hang and Roy would be sitting next to, he'd be sitting in cause he was always a warrior when it came to sitting in and playing. And there were a couple of times at Bradley's we ended up on the bandstand together. And we, we, we really liked each other. Now to say that I know Roy, I can't say that I really know Roy, I really knew Roy because he was a bit of an enigma. An enigma. You know, he was kind of hard to get to know, but every time we were around, we were always friendly. It was, and he would call me one, he, call, he would call me every now and then and leave me a message on my voicemail and say, hey, Russell Malone, fuck you, you bad motherfucker. Something like that, you know, he would do that kind of stuff. And I, and, and, and I took it, you know, as, as I took it all in the spirit of love, you know, but uh, he ended up, we ended up doing a few gigs together. We did a, we go on the road together, went on the road together a couple of times. Uh, there was one time me, him and Gerald Cannon did a tour of Spain and uh, just guitar, trumpet and piano. I'm, I'm sorry, guitar, trumpet and bass. And it was great. And every time we played music together, it was always a great experience because Roy loves songs and I like songs mm -hmm. and we like melody. We like groove. We're versatile. So uh, he called me to do a tour with him of Italy back in 1998. That's where we, we recorded that record. Uh, Habana or Cresol. Yeah. Yeah, you got a Grammy. I'm looking at the Grammy right now. I got a Grammy for that. For that recording yeah how about i was gonna ask about that yeah yeah man and we played and that I, I i gotta say that's uh that was fun it was we, we were eating good food every night laughing jamming playing good music yeah I, you know when roy died that was it was uh although i didn't um to say that i knew him on a personal level would be a bit of a stretch but it did hurt when he died because we had played because when you play music that's a very intimate and personal thing when you play music together. And uh, I just felt that when he died, uh, a part of me went with him and the music scene suffered a bit because Roy was younger, he was about 10 years younger than me, but he was an old soul and his presence kept a lot of uh, the BS in check. Yeah. So he would go to jam sessions and just by him being there, his presence alone would just elevate the surroundings. Now you go to a lot of jam sessions, you got a, there's a lot of bullshit and drama that go. That's why I don't go, I don't, I mean, I like smalls, but I don't go down there. I don't go to the, a, lot of the, a lot of the jam sessions because it's just too many, you know, young people walking around with the chest stuck out, like, you know, like, come on, yeah. you ain't there yet. But Roy kept, his presence kept a lot of the BS in check. And plus, you know, back, you know, when I first hit the scene, and even before I hit the scene, musicians were more humble. There was a lot more humility among the younger players because a lot of the old players, the old timers, kept a lot of the shit in check and they would say something. If they said something to you, you didn't get all offended and get on social media 
and come after people the way people do now. You know, because we, we, we took we took it at, in, all in the spirit of love. Yeah. Can't really do that now. But, you know, I see a lot of these people, they do that. They get on social media. They even, they even got social media beefs. What is that? That's, you know, I, 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 I'm pretty sure you were being, you're, you're people, some people from your generation, you've probably seen some of that. All the time, yeah. These social media beefs. And, you know, coming after somebody on social media is not a very smart thing to do because that's a very... It's a very, that's a very good way to get a beat down or if you, you know, or bullet. I've seen that happen too. I've seen people catch bullets and get the shit beat out of them for coming after other people on social media. Yeah. You know, and uh, so we, you know, if you millennials are watching, are watching this interview, if you see this, watch that because it's not, it's not a very wise idea to come after people on social media, because, especially if people getting into, into beefs with strangers or arguments with strangers. Oh, yeah. And I don't, that never made sense to me because you never know what that person is capable of doing. You never know what experiences they've gone through in their life. You don't know their background. People are, you, you, people are just, you know, you don't know, you don't know how people are wired out here. So, but I know, I, 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 I go on Facebook sometimes and I see these musicians who play at Smalls beefing with each other. I'm like, what the hell is that shit about? Yeah. You know, it's not a very smart thing to do. That's why I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't hang out. I used to hang out a lot, but I don't hang out that much these days because there's people are just people, are, the, the jazz scene, I don't want to say the jazz scene, but some people, certain people in the jazz scene are just so fake and so phony and messy. You know what I mean? And you yeah. can't keep a, you can't keep a clean reputation when you hang out with messy people. Yeah. So that's why you don't really see me out that much these days. I'd rather stay home hang out with my lady, have a night, have her cook me a nice meal or take her out to a night because I'm not going to try to cook for her because I'm not on her level. But, <laughs> you're saying you could cook a good meal, though. You don't think you're... Well, well, I can cook, but not not like Mar not like Mariko. No, 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 no. Oh. No, I can't do that. She's, but I'd rather be at home and focus on other things. And I'd, I'd be 60 years old this year. I have no time for the drama. I'd rather... If there's somebody out there who I really, who I really want to see... I'll do that, but I don't do I don't do a, lo a whole lot of hanging out these days. I'd rather just be home. That kind of segues to what I had another question. Um, this is going to be kind of long, but that's all right. I saw you were um, there was an interview you talk about when you were in Philadelphia um, playing with Trudy Pitts, and Kenny Burrell came to your gig, and um, these people were telling you, "Oh, you're you're pushing boundaries," like your friends were saying this, and then. Uh, Kenny Burrell said, it takes a lot of courage to play what the situation called for in that you should play what the music calls for. And anytime you try to start proving anything to anybody, the music isn't honest. That's right. So uh, by the way, that, that mirror that's that, that mirror that you have, I have that same mirror in my bedroom. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. My friend gave it to me. <laughs> I'm sorry. My friend gave it to me. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, back to Kenny Burrell. I, I just talked to him not too long ago. I mean, that man means so much to me. He Have you ever met him? Have you met him? I haven't, unfortunately. Yeah. Beautiful human being. No nonsense. No, just right to the point. He's going to give it to you straight. No chaser. But yeah, he was um, a huge, is a huge influence on me. His sound. That man was blessed with one of the most beautiful sounds on the instrument. Uh, I'll never forget one night, me and uh, one of my favorite guitar players, Peter Bernstein, about 25 years ago, actually almost coming up on 30 years ago, we played a gig at the Tribeca Art Center. And we played this tune by Clifford Brown, Sandu. You know that song. Mm -hmm. And we, we sat in, we, we played with Kenny because he was being honored that night. And Peter and I, you know, we respect this man so much. And we played uh, the best that we could. You know, we did our best. We played first and Kenny Burrell came behind us with that big, warm, creamy, buttery sound. And in two notes, just wiped out everything that we even could have even thought about playing that night. And it wasn't him trying to cut anybody or trying to, you know, he was just being Kenny. But that experience and that sound, and I, you know, the lesson in that was when your sound is highly developed that way and with that experience, you don't have to overstate anything. 
And that's what I got from him and, and people like Ben Webster with those beautiful sounds, you know? But back to what you were talking about, uh, that encounter that I had with Kenny, he sure, he, he, he sure set me straight that day. Because a lot of times you've been on the New York scene for a while and you have probably gone out to see people play. And a lot of times what they're playing is not always in service of the music. You know, it's always a lot of uh, weirdness for the sake of being weird. And it's very self-indulgent. And then the more somebody in the audience will go, some of these young wannabe hip people will, the more they will respond by saying, woo, oh yeah, man, woo. The more funkier <laughs> the bullshit becomes. You know, I'm not, I know you've seen this. I know you've seen this. And I know you know what I'm talking about because I've heard you play and I, and I have a sense of what you're about. You're about music. So, and when Kenny Burrell told me that, I was like, you know, he is absolutely right. I mean, he, he wasn't harsh, but he was very stern. That, you know, and you know how it is when a father or a parent would chastise one of the kids? That's what it felt like to me. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why I was able to play with a lot of the people that I played with because of learning that lesson from him, you know, learning that lesson, hearing it, and then applying what he, what he, what he had to say to me. You know, the funny thing about old people, they, they, they don't always, some old people don't always say anything right then, but they're, they're always watching you. And then when they do say something to you, they only tell you once, and then they will sit back and they will watch you to see if you're paying attention. Case in point, Ray Brown gave me a, a, a good lesson one time, which, you know, you, you mentioned John Collins earlier. Mm -hmm. Ray Brown was the one who uh, turned me on to John Collins. Back in 1990, we were in New York. It was me, Ray Brown, uh, you know, Ned Gould? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Charles' father. He played with Harry Connick also. Yeah. Shannon Powell on drums and Harry Connick. We were supposed to do some kind of a television show, but Harry ended up coming three hours later. He was late, which left us, which left me, Ned, and Shannon uh, there to play with Ray Brown and hang out with him. And Ray, man, he, he dropped so much stuff on us that day. He told me the story about Bird back in 1945, 44, um, he was playing a gig with Charlie Parker at some club. And he talked about how Charlie Parker, stuff that other jazz musicians may deem as corny, Charlie Parker embraced it. Cause Charlie Parker was a huge country fan. He'd be in a club, it would be nothing to see him in a club or in a bar standing at a jukebox, putting money into the jukebox and listening to country music. <laughs> really? I mean, wow. and, 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 and somebody said to him one time, well, Bird, you're the great Charlie Parker. Why the hell are you listening to this country stuff? And Bird's response would be, listen to the stories. Listen to the stories. Ooh. Charlie Parker was not too, he was, he was hip, but he wasn't that damn hip. He wasn't so high and mighty to get down with some country music, you know? But anyway, Ray told me that they were playing one night and Charlie Parker kicked off this tune called My Melancholy Baby. You know that song? I haven't played it, but... But you, you've heard that song. Yeah, yeah. Man. and that's a song that a lot of musicians wouldn't touch. But Bird played that song, and Ray Brown told me that Charlie Parker, who never played a whole lot of long solos, he said that he really stretched out on this song that night. And I got goosebumps hearing him tell the story. And when he started to, he started to sing fragments of what Charlie Parker played from the 40s. He started to sing fragments of his solo. That was that's just, man, I just, ooh, I just get goosebumps just talking about it now. Just singing fragments of what Bird played in the 40s. He remembered that. So uh, that was so interesting. And uh, so we played some tunes and, you know, he taught us some songs that we hadn't, hadn't uh, that we didn't know. And so after, when Harry finally showed up, we did what we had, what we had to do. So you know how it is when you get around younger, when, when, when you know you get around older players, you always want to get some constructive feedback on what you're doing. 
So I asked him, I said, well, Mr. Brown, I said, man, it's such a great honor to, to, to meet you and to play with you. Um, is there anything in my playing that you could uh, tell me to address some things to work on? So he said to me, he's a kid, you, you know, you, you can play. You, you sound all right, you're all right. You know, old people, they, 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 and those old guys aren't going to ever be raving and stru stru uh, stroking your ego. They, they're not going to do that shit. Forget it. If you go into anybody's band, Ron Carter's band, or any of those old timers looking to have your ego stroke, forget about it. Yeah. They're not going to stroke you. But he told me, he said, you okay, you play. But he said, you've got a lot to learn, kid. He said, you ever hear of a, a guitar player named John Collins? Who I had heard of John Collins, but I had because I was um, I was reading about all the guitar players, you know, but I never really checked out John Collins. He said, "Well, I'm going to give you his number." So he went through his little book, wrote down John Collins' number, <laughs> and his exact words to me, Allison, his exact words to me. Do you ever you ever meet Ray Brown? I never did. He was a very he was a very upfront, gruff guy who gave it to you straight, no chaser. He, he, he wrote the number down, gave me the number, and then he pointed his finger at me. He said, the next time you are in Los Angeles, you call John Collins, and then you take your little young ass over there and go get some of that shit. Those were his exact words. <laughs> so we never talked about it again. So when I did get to uh, LA, I got to LA, uh, we were playing a gig at the Universal Sheraton with Harry. So I called John and he was very gruff. He was a gruff old man. He picked up, the phone rang, he picked up the phone, he went, what? He didn't say hello, he said, what, yeah, what? <laughs> like that. I'm like, oh, oh shit. <laughs> but I told him who I was and uh, why I was in town. And I told him that, uh, I'd like to to uh, to get together with you while I'm here, and he wasn't having it. He was not interested. And then I said, "Well, man, think of something. Think fast, Russell." So I told him that I played with Jimmy Smith, and that Ray Brown had gave me his number, which kind of softened him up a little bit. So he said, "Well, where are you staying?" So I said, "I'm staying at the Hotel Sofitel over on Beverly Boulevard." So he came and picked me up. And on the way to his house, I'm trying to engage him in small talk, but he was not feeling it. He didn't, he was, you know, was giving me these monosyllabic answers. He wasn't really in a, talk, in a talkative mood. But you know what? I didn't let it get uh, to me too bad because the fact that the old man got into his car, came over and picked me up, that was good enough for me. So I went to his house. First thing he wanted me to do was to uh, play for him. So at the time, I was, you know, into Pat Martino, Billy Bean, and George, and I was still, I'm still into those guys. And I was playing a lot of single lines. I think I started improvising over all the things you are, the song is you, you know, playing all my fast stuff. And I could hear him like groaning, like, oh God, another one. One of those, but you know, that kind of that kind of reaction. So he said, well, let, let, me, let, me, let me see your box. That's what the old time was called the guitar. They, they call it the box. So let me see your box. So I gave him my box. And this old man, Allison, with those arthritic fingers played, he played the most beautiful rendition of Lush Life. He played Lush Life. And then he also played Blame It On My Youth. That was another one of his go-to tunes, Blame It On My Youth. Great songs, two great songs, by the way. So, um, he played all of this beautiful stuff and I, it took me about five minutes to, to pick my jaw up off the floor because I was just so totally mesmerized by what I had heard. And he said something to me uh, that I'll never forget. He said that one of the things that disappoints him about a lot of the younger players is that everybody's so busy wanting, wanting to be horn players. He said, that's all great playing single lines like a horn or like Charlie Parker and Dizzy, that's great. That's all a part of it. But if that's all you concentrate on, then you're really selling the instrument short. There's so much beauty that can be extracted from the instrument. Mm -hmm. 
And he said, uh, it can function as a small orchestra in your hands if you approach it that way. And then, you know, John was also a World War II veteran who had traveled all over the world and he had seen Segovia. Mm -hmm. And he talked about when he saw Andre Segovia, how he was able to sit on that stage with just a guitar, no, no sound system. Um, maybe, well, actually, maybe just a mic in front of the guitar and just mesmerize the audience with the beauty of the instrument. Because a lot of people, they think that chops, having chops and virtuosity is just <laughs> playing fast. There are layers and different levels to virtuosity and having chops and, and, and technique and facility, not just playing a whole lot of fast stuff. And uh, it took me a while to get that, but I um, having that conversation with him and just spending those 11 years with him, really, um, it turned my, 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 my uh, it, it altered my perspective. And I have to, have to mention one other guy. Now you may or may not have heard of him because he's not a famous guy, but he taught at Berkeley College of Music back in the 60s and uh, maybe early 70s. And he was teaching down at uh, the University of North Florida, Jack Peterson. Do you know that name? I don't. Jack Peterson, he taught Abercrombie. I think he might've taught Schofield. But this man, you ever hear those, those Johnny Smith things? Those things that Johnny Smith played? Jack Hall, he, he had all of that stuff under his fingers and then some. I met him when I was down in Florida around that time too, around the same time I met John. And man, that guy, he's a heavy guy. So those two guys, between Jack Peterson and John Collins, those were two, the two gentlemen who really are responsible for me looking at the guitar from that point of view. I was, um, since you were talking about Ray Brown, um, I was wondering if there was a difference in your approach to playing with Ron Carter as there was to playing with Ray Brown and maybe some similarities and differences between studying with both of them. Well, not really because- I, and, 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 I don't know why I said study, but yeah. I, 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 I know what you meant. Well, yeah, I was studying with them. Yeah. If you, if you really want to look at it that way, because every night I was learning something. Every night was in school yeah. playing with both of those guys. but. I'm going to answer your question, but I want to get back to what I was, back to Ray Brown. Um, had I not listened to him, had I not gone to John Collins like he instructed me to, I don't think he would have ever hired me. Because the old people, they'll tell you something, but they, they're going to sit back and watch you to see if you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And he found out that I was, uh, had gone to John Collins. And he was like, I told you. And he hired me. He started calling me for gigs. Ron Carter sent me to Gene Bertoncini. You know Gene, right? Mm -mm. You never heard of Gene Bertoncini? You've been in New York all this long? You, you never heard of Gene? He's someone you need to know. He's still around. But Ron, I, 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 he told me, uh, I went to his house one time back in the, uh, I can make, make, maybe back in the 80s, maybe 90s, the 90s. And, you know, once again, I asked him, for some constructive feedback. And, you know, Ron's another one of those guys that's going to give it to you straight. And he asked me about Gene Bertacini, who I had heard about, but I'd never heard him. So Gene used to work at this place called La Madeleine. It was right across the street from uh, Manhattan Plaza Apartments. He had a, excuse me, he had a regular gig every Sunday. And I went to go see him. And Ron told me this. He said, listen, go, go just go watch him. He said, you're not going to get a whole lot of, pyro, a lot of pyrotechnics, but what you're going to get is a lot of music. Just go, and, and he was playing solo guitar, he's a master solo guitarist. And he told me, he said, just go over there and just watch him and just look at how he gets around the guitar. And I did it. And this is before Ron hired me. Now, I went and did it. Now, I don't think that Ron Carter would have hired me had I not listen to what he told me to do. He told me to listen to Gene, go check out Gene. Ray Brown told me to go check out John Collins. I listened to both of those guys. And I, as a result of that, I managed to have a very productive relationship with him and uh, uh, Ray Brown. I played with Ray up until the day he died. And I'm still playing, still playing with Ron now. 
going on um, 28 years. Because he started, Ron started calling me for gigs in 1995. Mm -hmm. So 28 years of having a musical association with uh, Ron Carter. And to answer your question about, did I have to change my approach? Yes and no, because both of those guys, they're very stylistically different, but they're also some things that they have in common. One of the things, two things that they have in common was the quarter note, actually three things, the quarter note, the beat, and the choice of notes. There's never any randomness going on with Ray Brown or Ron Carter. Every note that they play has a place and a purpose. Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I see a lot of young guys today, they're all about, oh man, I got that hump. And they're pulling the strings real hard and oh, make it that hump, man. Or if you're black, they use the term, I'm droid, I'm negroid. <laughs> you probably heard some people say that. Maybe they may, may, maybe they won't say that around you, but oh, when it's yeah. black people together, hey, I'm not got that I'm negroid. I got that negroid feeling. And I understand what they're talking about. Yeah. But they got the negroid shit, but without a lot of the intellectual capacity that goes with it. See, I mean, it, it, it's not just, it's not just, um, I mean, it is feeling, but it helps when you know what's going on harmonically, musically. And then, you know, like Ron, you never hear Ron do this, play hard. You never heard Ray Brown play all hard like that. And, you know, a lot of times when people do that, funny things start to happen with the time, mm. the intonation. And a lot of these guys, they're just, you know, harmonically, they're very deficient, you know, but you, uh, Ray Brown and Ron Carter, David Wong, uh, Peter Washington, Christian McBride, um, the bass player who plays in my band, Vincent DuPont, Luke Selleck. Um, you ever hear of a guy named Larry Grenadier? Yeah. You know that name? Mm -hmm. One of all these guys, and I could name some more too, but I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now, but those guys that I just named, they are very musical. They have the, the funk, the hump, but they also have the musicality that goes with it. And that's one of the things that I look for when I, when I play with a bass player, musicality. You gotta have the beat, it's true enough, but the harmony, the sound, because all those guys that I mentioned, they get good sounds out of the instrument. Yeah. Well, these guys with all this, you know, that pulling the strings and like they're shooting a bow and arrow, like, they're like archers instead of bass players. <laughs> if I see that, I'm like, nah, you'll never play in my band playing like that. Yeah. And then plus another thing that I got from uh, Ray Brown and Ron, it's the function of the bass, you know, they play the bass, they know the role of the bass. I remember doing a workshop with Ray Brown one time and uh, he had some of the guys, some of the young players play for him. And there was this one guy who had all of this facility, just going all up and down the fingerboard. And Ray listened to him. And then Ray took the bass from him and told him, he said, listen, what you just played was impressive, but as long as you are playing like that, I will always have a job. <laughs> and then he started playing, just walking this blues, just by himself, no assistance, no drums, no piano, no guitar, just started walking this blues. And that was it. He didn't need to say anything else, you know? Yeah, so playing with Ray Brown and Ron Carter, they're, they're, they're definitely, there's definitely some stylistic difference, but at the same time, when it comes to those things, those principles that I just pointed out to you, that was never an afterthought. And I, in both of those situations, I do a lot of four to the bar. I play a lot of rhythm guitar. I don't change the way I play rhythm guitar. <laughs> I just, you know, I just play that, play that, and it works. I mean, there's, some, I, I take that back. There's some other ways that I will use like the way that uh, Herb Ellis approached uh, playing in Oscar Peterson's band because Herb, he didn't always play chump, 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 chump. He would do some, some shouts and some little fills every now and then. I, I do that too. Oscar Moore did the same thing. Uh, so I would do that, but I did it in both situations. It just depends on what else is going on in the band. It depends on what they're doing. Yeah. That makes sense? Yeah, totally. And okay. I was going to ask, you've recorded um, the song Flowers 
for Emmett Till. Yeah. A few times you had it on your your first album. I was just messing around with that the other day. Funny you shouldn't mention that. Yeah. yeah. You you played that and then you recorded it in a quartet setting. Um, you're playing at D'Angelico on that, and then with Benny Green on the album Bluebird. Is right. There I and played I my, and, and I used my first. Uh, you have my first recording. Mm -hmm. I played it on nylon string. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. That's yeah, a cool little tune. Yeah. Do you know how, you wanted you, you were you about to ask me about that tune? I wanted to hear about the story, and then I feel like each time there's a there's a different feel. Like yeah, th on. there's a story behind that. Uh, yeah. Back in um, junior high school, actually, actually high school. There was a uh, when I was going to school, there were no black history classes, but I did thankfully have some teachers who were socially conscious, and they were um, they were t turning us on to information about black people, about us, not just about us, but about the world, the history of our world. That a lot of uh, the teachers were not addressing. Now, I'm, you know the story of Emmett Till, right? You know the story. Okay. Prior to that, I mean, I was aware of racism. I experienced racism growing up. I remember, you know, when I was about eight, nine years old, I was coming home from school one day, I got jumped by some white kids. You know, they beat the hell out of me. But that's another story. Uh, one day, Miss McCree Harris, rest her soul, she was one of the ones who was always one of the socially conscious teachers who was always turning us on to information and history about us. So she came to school one day with this uh, old copy of a Jet magazine from the 50s. You know that magazine? You probably, you probably don't know nothing about that yet. And there was a picture. Actually, she told the story first. She told the story about this young 14-year-old kid from Chicago who was visiting his uncle in Mississippi who was murdered because of um, the way he addressed a white woman. I guess this, he supposedly whistled at her or said something flirtatious to her. And later that night, I guess she went back and told her husband and her husband brought one of his buddies and a few other people knocked on the guy's door, on the uncle's door at night and said, we want the boy, we looking for the boy who did the talking. We want that boy who did the talking. And they had shotguns drawn on the man's uncle, on, on, on his uncle, the old man. So they took him and they, you know, they killed him, they murdered him. You know the story. So she told us this story. And then after she told the story, she opened up that magazine it went to each one of us in the classroom, showed us the picture of this young boy whose body was totally mutilated. He didn't even look human. It was a before picture of him before he got killed, and then the picture of him lying in the coffin. In fact, his mother, Mamie Till Mobley, wanted an open coffin funeral because she wanted to see, she wanted the world to see what ignorance and hate had done to her son. So she walked around each student's desk, showed this picture to us, and she stood there for about maybe 10 seconds, each student's desk for about 10 seconds and showed us this. And Allison, I had nightmares for a long time. I mean, have you seen that picture? Yeah, I had nightmares uh, for a long time. But then, you know, uh, about a year or so later, I started to hear this melody in my head, you know? And over time, it developed. It was the first, in, fact, in fact, that was the first tune I ever wrote, <laughs> Flowers from Matil. And over time, it developed, and I figured I'd, I'd record it. And it's, it's, still, it's still developing it. I want to do it one day uh, with the string ensemble. You made a string quartet on orchestra. Yeah. So, uh, but that's how that tune, that's the story behind that tune. For, but the thing is, yeah, it's such a dark story, but then there's this like in D major and there's like some kind of, there's some kind of, I almost feel like optimism 
behind it? Is there is there some kind of story or is that just? Well, you know what? I guess when you think about it, uh, I, I, because when I when I when I play that tune, I'm aware of the story. I mean, I, I know I'm familiar with the story of Emmett Till, and I see the picture of him being uh, all mutilated and stuff in the coffin. But then I look at the before picture. You look at the picture of him before. I mean, it was a very good looking, handsome, beautiful young kid. He was a child. So I guess I was approaching it from that perspective. From, he was an innocent child who got killed, you know? Yeah. Oh, wow. Woo. So heavy. Wow. Um, <laughs> with that, um, I'm going to go back to what we were talking about with um, Kenny Burrell and you're talking about um, musicians now. I know I've heard you talk about Dan Wilson and Cecil Alexander. Are the, Those are some musicians that you think kind of hold that, those ideals that Kenny Burrell was talking about. Are there some other musicians that... Well, you know what? Uh, I would put you in that category too. <laughs> no, no, seriously, you know, because you, uh, Sam Raiderman, Isaiah Sharkey, uh, and see, I'm, you know, I, I'm not a purist. I'm not, I'm not a traditionalist. I'm definitely uh, an advocate of learning the history and upholding the tradition to a degree, but I'm not a slave to it because I think that each generation, you, 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 and uh, Jocelyn Gould, um, a few of the other young musicians out here, I think each generation brings something different to the music. I don't think there's anything with you incorporating some of the things, some of the music of your time into the music. I think everybody should come to their own conclusions how, as to how anything can be approached, how music can be played, how living life can be approached. Um, there's nothing wrong with that because it takes, somebody once told me that it takes a lot of different types of flowers to make a garden. If all the flowers are looking the same, if all the plants and trees look the same, it would be a boring world. Nobody wants to look at that, you know? And uh, coming to your own conclusions about something, about anything, it's, it's essential. It's just like, you know, that was a period in my uh, life when I felt that I had to play things a certain way, to play certain types of music, certain types of tune, because I wanted people to like me. I was concerned about, well, man, what's this old person going to think about me? I want them to like me. But after a while, I'm like, wait a minute. When it comes to being Russell Malone, there's nobody better than being than, than Russell Malone. You know, I'm the best I am at being me. Alison Yaffe is the best there is at, 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 when it comes to being Alison Yaffe. There's nobody better than you, you know? So I think that it's very important to, to, to get to that point in your life. If you get to my age and you haven't gotten to that point, then something is something is going terribly wrong with you. <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, it's just kind of like re realizing that your parents aren't perfect. They don't walk on water. You don't have to love or like anything, everything about them. And that's OK. It doesn't mean that you don't respect them. But I think that that's a healthy part, a healthy step towards your own development. As much as I love some of the players that we've mentioned in uh, the players who've come before me, I don't like all of the musical choices that they make. And you don't have to like everything about them. Doesn't mean that you don't respect them, but you don't have to like everything about them. You have to make your own choices about, uh, about playing this music. And, you know, and, and a lot of times, you know, when you do that, sad to say, but sometimes that entails pissing off old people. <laughs> You're not going to make old people happy all the time. And old people, some old people, not all of them, but a lot of them are funny because they, I've heard people talk about, well, son, son, so these young guys don't have their own style. I don't hear nothing new or original. But then when somebody comes up with something that's different, then they start, they start ragging on them. And I'm like, well, goddamn, make up your mind, you know? Yeah, so you got to follow, follow, follow what's in here. That's what keeps the music progressing. But at the same time, be aware of the, of, of the tradition. But don't be a slave. That's why I, I, my heart goes out to Robert Glasper. You know, Robert, I don't know if you knew this, but Robert started out in my band. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I took Robert. First time he went, went, went to Europe, Robert went on the road with me. 
And I could tell then that he uh, had something. I told, we just talked the other day and I told him, I said, man, I knew that you were gonna make a major impact on this music. You know, some people may like him, some people may not like him, but Robert Glasper has definitely made a, he, he's left his mark. He's left his mark. So I first heard him at a place called Pork Knockers. Um, he was playing with, I think he was playing with Eric Wyatt. You know, Eric, he's turned a lot of young cats on. <laughs> you know, Eric? I just, yeah, I just. Yeah, he's turned a lot of, he's put a lot of young guys, of the young guys on. But I met him through Eric Wyatt. And I could tell then that just from the way he played, the way he looked, you know, he had a different kind of vibe about him. And he had a very uh, fertile imagination. So and he's doing something, you know, he's doing something that's, uh, he thinks outside the box. So uh, Esperanza Spalding, I like her. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of, young, a lot of young musicians who are, are doing some very wonderful things. Some of them, it took me a while to, uh, to hear it, but just because an older person can't hear it immediately, it doesn't mean that it's not valid. Maybe you need to catch up. You know what I mean? Yeah, so there are a few that I've uh, heard and I was like, hmm. And then I kept listening, gave him, gave, gave him a fair shot. I'm like, okay, there's something there. Then again, there's a lot of bullshit out there too and I'm not afraid to call that one out either. <laughs> but we'll, we'll save that for another time. <laughs> Oh, wow. I could ask you questions all day. How are you doing on time? <laughs> I'm, good. I'm okay. I'm good. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so uh, before I met you, I always heard over the years, I mean, heard your albums, but people would always talk about um, how much humor you had and how many jokes you were always telling. Do you, do you think there's a, a comparison with music and comedy? And do you feel like it's kind of changed over the years? Well, I know the attitude, I don't know about the music and comedy, but, but I know the attitude towards it has changed because, you know, I'm, I'm, people tell me they like my humor, but that's nothing new. I mean, listen, I came up around Jimmy Smith, uh, a lot of the old timers, uh, some of the blues players that I played with, like Clarence Carter, being on the road with him and being around people like Johnny Taylor, Bobby Rush, Comedian Wild Man Steve, he, 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 Betty Wright, we, Denise LaSalle, we did shows with all these people. And they were funny as hell, man. Jimmy Smith, um, uh, who else? Ray Brown, Jack McDuff. I used to go to his house. And man, we bonded through the humor. We bonded through humor. Um, I don't know if you could do that with a lot of the younger musicians now because everybody's so woke mm. and uh, so easily offended. You know, and, uh, you know, you go to humor and food. That's what bonded the guys of my generation with the guys who came before us. You know, we go out after the gig, get a good meal, talk, laugh, tell jokes. And, and there will be women there, too. He would be, who would be worse than us. <laughs> you know, Sarah Vaughn and who I never hung with, but I met her. I met her and I met uh, I met uh, Carmen McRae. Never hung with her, but I heard that they were, they, 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 those guys had nothing on them. I did hang with Dorothy Donegan one time. You know that name, Dorothy Donegan, pianist? I did hang with her back in 1995 down in uh, Columbia, South Carolina at the Main Street Jazz Festival. Baby, let me tell you, she was something else. Funny as hell. Betty Carter, who I did get to hang with. Funny as hell. You know, and then, you know, nobody was concerned about being easily offended or politically correct and all that stuff. But that, I think that happened with, over the last, within the last 10, 20 years. You can't really bond with a lot of the younger people now because, you know, um, I don't know what that's about, but I, don't, I, I, you know, I'm not, I'll be honest with you. I'm not very comfortable hanging around with people your age yeah. because you just never know. I mean, there was one piano player I won't call any names, but I played a prank on her. And then she went on Facebook and basically lied on me and said that I had son, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, a lot of the chicks on there were trying, well, not chicks, sorry about that. A lot of the women were trying to put the Me Too spin on it. I'm like, well, wait a minute. It was just a joke. But then I, the same lady had 
said some things to me yeah. about, you yeah. know, about stuff, you know, had sense. And then I said, so I figured, I, I got comfortable. I said, well, yeah. So I did what I did, you know, told her the joke. And then she, you know, went on, went on social media. And, but people who knew me and, and who knew her, how full of shit she was, they didn't, you know, it didn't fly. <laughs> I'm not, you probably know who I'm talking about. I'm not going to call the name, but you know, when she got to New York, she was being passed around like a bad cold. But that's another story. <laughs> that's I'm not going. I'm not going to go there. I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it positive. Yeah. But uh, you know, so I'm not really comfortable with people. Well, with a lot of the younger people these days, because you, you, you can't really bond with them. Yeah. The way that we did in the past. Yeah. No, I can. Put, I'm. I feel like there's something. I mean, I might not even. I don't know if I'll put this in the interview or not, but I feel like there's some kind of disconnect with like the way my generation, the way they're playing music, the way they're approaching it, the way they view mentorship, the way, yeah, the way humor is, I feel like it's all kind of connected in some sort of way. I'm trying to make sense of it, but there's, a, there's some kind of disconnect. The music's not connecting the way they're playing. I don't know. It's just, it's. Some well, I think um, a lot of these, I mean, it's good. There are some gigs out here, but when I came up, there were more gigs, mm -hmm. and there was uh, there were um, there was more of a connection and a and, and a camaraderie between the the cats, as well as the musicians, with the previous generations. There was more respect, and then um, something happened along the way. You know, now with the, with social media, you see a lot of these people on social media practicing or playing to a track you know but they and they sound good a lot of them sound really good but when you put them in a situation where they got to play with people it doesn't sound as convincing mm -hmm. it's a little different because you know imagine okay you see a boxer in the gym <laughs> working out on the heavy bag right working working on the heavy bag and boy they look great man they look great However, they're not reacting to anything because the heavy bag doesn't punch back. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think it's, 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 it's okay to do that. I never do that shit. I put up some video clips of me playing some solo guitar on, uh, on social media, but eh, that's about all. I mean, that's, all, that's about all I'll do and I haven't done that in a while. But I see guys practicing with uh, a track playing in the background and you know, that approach doesn't work for me. I mean, do what you want to do, but I prefer not to do it that way. Yeah. So I think a lot of that has a, an effect on how people play the music. And a lot of these kids, they only play in the classroom or in the schoolroom. And you know, they're not playing in front of an audience and getting feedback from the audience. You know, because sometimes, you know, when I was coming up, if you were playing in front of the audience and they gave you that yeah that was encouraging when you could get that feedback from the audience but if your shit was raggedy some of those audience members they would they, they, they would let you know well a lot of these young kids today don't they don't have that opportunity that's why you know i teach over at william patterson university and i try to impart some of those values to the kids and i will even let some of them come to my gigs and sit in with me just so they can get a sense of what it feels like to play in front of an audience to play on a stage and to play with a rhythm section, a real rhythm section. Because you know, when it comes to them, a lot of times when they're playing with each other, it's a case of the blind leading the blind. They have all good intentions, but the judgment isn't always the best. So it's an, it isn't always good. Um, just one more thing. I wanted to ask you, oh, um, there was a past interview you had where you were talking about um, when you would talk to Jimmy Smith and Wes Montgomery would be brought up and how emotional he would get. And um, that playing with Wes Montgomery was like a beautiful marriage. Um, and I was wondering if there were any musicians that you felt that same. Oh yeah, Ron Carter. Hmm. Playing with Ron Carter. You, you, you told me that you came to the concert that we did at Berlin. I didn't, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to say hello to you that night. Oh, okay. you, it, was, it was very packed that night, yeah. Yeah, but you, you sent me a note saying that you enjoyed the music. Oh, it, was, it was beautiful, yeah. 
That was really yeah, cool. thank you so much. Yeah, but playing with Ron, I have uh, we we have a special connection musically. Uh, playing with Mo Ramilla was like that. Playing with Donald Vega, the pianist in uh, Don, in Ron Carter's band. Mo and Ron were the pianist in that band. Uh, I had that kind of simpatico with Biddy Green. Uh, I have it with my piano player, Rick Germanson. Uh, yeah, but Jimmy, he was he loved West. That's the only time I ever got to see him on the verge of tears talking about West Montgomery. And he told me that uh, when they made that recording, the dynamic duo, you know that record, you know, they had never met before oh, that date. They, they were aware of each other. And he told me that uh, wow. West didn't know. like to fly. He drove that Cadillac everywhere. He didn't like to fly. That was so, how Grant Green was too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he had a green, Grant, George Winston the Grant had a green Cadillac that he drove everywhere. But uh, Wes didn't, didn't, didn't like to fly. But he, Jimmy told me that uh, he was, on the day of that recording session, um, he was standing outside before the session, smoke, smoking a cigarette, right? So this Cadillac pulls into the, uh, into the driveway. Pulled into this long, have you been to Rudy's Van Gelder Studios? Yeah, so you know the driveway. West pulls into the driveway. Gets out of the car, clean as a whistle, because West was always impeccably dressed. Reached, put, put his hat on, put his you know, hat on his suit, hat on a powder blue suit. And he said, he re reached into the back seat, got his guitar. And Jamie's watching him and Wes, is watching Jimmy and he's walking to and they eyeballing each other. So he gets up to Jimmy and say, Are you Jimmy Smith? And Jimmy says, Yeah, I'm Jimmy Smith. And he said to Jimmy said, West said to Jimmy, I heard about you. Don't start no shit. <laughs> That's what he had. I swear to God. That's exactly what Jimmy told me. West said, Don't start no shit. He said, I heard about you. I heard about how you like to mess with guitar players. Don't start no shit. <laughs> and they went into the studio and just, they made that record in one day. And Jimmy told me another story. Now, this is not, this is not one that you're going to find in a book. In fact, I haven't told too many people this one, but he told me that in the, in the studio, they were playing some tune and uh, Wes was into his thing. And Jimmy was up on him, putting all that shit behind him. And he said, <laughs> Wes looked over at Jimmy and shot him, the gave him the finger. <laughs> he was like, yeah. <laughs> Swear to God, that's what Jimmy told me. Now, I wasn't there. I don't know. But this is what <laughs> Jimmy told me. He said, Wes gave him the finger. <laughs> but the vibe in the studio, you can, you can tell just from the music, the vibe was just so positive yeah. in the studio, man. So, yeah. And Wes had a good sense of humor, too. I, I, I've talked to people who knew him. So I think, yeah, you know, I think most musicians are pretty humorous. Ron Carter has a sense of humor. It's dry, but it's very, very clever and very witty, very witty. Yeah, but I think a lot of that has to, you know, when people are comfortable with each other where they can laugh and have a good time, I think that has an effect on how the music is played. The music is serious, but don't take yourself too serious. Don't take yourself so serious to the, po to the point of where you're pain in the ass to be around. Have a good time, relax. You know what I mean? Relax. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I, um, so was it through Ray Brown that you met Diana Krall? Nope, nope. Oh. I'll tell you how I met Diana Krall. I met Diana Krall in 1994 in Bradley's. I was playing there with Mo Miller and Peter Washington. I knew of Diana Krall. I knew who she was, and I'd heard um, some of her stuff on the radio. She wasn't the mega star that she is now. She had just put out her first record. Uh, I, I don't remember the name of it. I can't remember the name of it. But uh, she came in Bradley's one night and introduced herself to me and said that she was uh, getting ready to record. She had just gotten signed with Impulse Records, and she was... Um, going to do a tribute to uh, the great Nat King Cole. And someone had told her that I was the guy, that I would be a good candidate for that band. So uh, she came in, we talked, sat at the bar and had a drink. 
and she listened to the music and uh, I ended up recording with her. But first, before the session, we ended up uh, doing a tour of Canada together. Now we played at the Montreal, Jazz, the Montreal Jazz Festival. That's what it was, the Montreal Jazz Festival. And uh, did a few other gigs and uh, they just felt right. Now you asked me about who I felt that I had a good musical uh, simpatico with. I would have to put her in that category too, because we played very well together. Yeah. Yeah. Vinnie Green, I think I mentioned him, Christian. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we ended up doing that uh, recording and I did, um, let's see, one, two, three, I think maybe four recordings with Diana. Yeah. So that was, that was a good gig, it was mutually benefiting for both of us. Because I, uh, I, ended, I ended up getting signed with Columbia, not Columbia, but with uh, Verb Records. Impulse first and then Impulse merged with Verb. So uh, yeah, but she was able to benefit from uh, whatever little contribution I brought to the music because those records sold very well. And I, th I thought I sounded pretty good on some of those records and all of them actually. Yeah. So, uh, and then, you know, me being in that situation was, was good for my profile. So I've, had, I've been in some very good situations, but none of that would have ever happened had I not played with people like Jimmy Smith. And I can't leave out Freddie Cole because I worked with him for a long time too. And, you know, Freddie taught me the importance of lyricism, learning songs, learning the lyrics, and uh, I picked up a lot. So all of those things that I picked up from those situations got me ready for the next situation. Yeah. And I've had some good situations. I worked with Sonny Rollins for about a year. That was incredible. I don't think I've ever heard that much out, uh, tenor player in my life, tenor playing in my life. Yeah. And we're playing with him. And we got along very well musically too. And the thing I miss about that gig, Allison, is I miss the music, but the, the conversations with Sonny Rollins was so fascinating. You know, he was um, a very deep thinker. Uh, and he would always talk about Clifford Brown. He talked about how Clifford Brown was one of the biggest inf inspirations for him to uh, to get his life back on track. Because you know, you know, Sonny's history made some great some great records, but he also had some issues that he had to they had to overcome. Like we all have, we all have things that we have to overcome at some point. But he told me that Clifford Brown was the one that really inspired him to uh, to get things back on track because Clifford lived such. An, such an exemplary life, such was such a nice, pe nice person. Yeah. Well, Russell, thank you so much for your time. That really meant a lot to me. Oh, it means a lot to me that you would even ask. You one of my, you one of my favorite, uh, not just musicians, but one of my favorite people on the scene, favorite people, persons, and that you know, because I don't. I'll be honest with you, Allison. There are a lot of people out here that I like, that I, I'm friendly with and I'm cordial, but I don't, a lot of them I don't, I just don't like because they're full of shit and a jive. You, I like. That's why I send you things. I tune into your gigs. If I can't make them, I'll tune in and offer you a little, a little bit of commentary because you are, you're a good person and you, you, you know, I'm going to keep my eyes and ears on you for a long time. As long as you're on the scene, I'll be keeping my eyes and ears on you. Thank you, Russell. It means so much. And that, mm -hmm. that was really special to me. Thank you. All right. All right. When is your next gig? What are you playing again? I'm playing. Good question. I have a weekly gig far away in Floral Park, but. In uh, Brooklyn? No, it's in uh, Queens. It's far away. I mean, we're in Queens. My girlfriend lives in Queens. I do get to Queens. Okay. Floral Park is um, kind of. By Long Island? Oh shit, I ain't going out there. I love you, but I ain't going that far. No, it's like, it's let, me, hey, let me know when you're playing in the city. Okay, I will. Thank you, Russell. I yeah, hope. Now, when I, when, when, now, this is going to be for your podcast or your website. What is this for? This is for, um, I have to type out the whole interview. It's a whole project for school. Okay. Yeah. Well, for school? Yeah, this is for, my, for grad school, for uh, Dr. Anthony Brinker's uh, jazz history class. Oh, okay. So, well, you, you can you can edit at your leisure or leave everything in. I stand behind everything that I said. I don't care. It's up to you. Thank you, Russell. All right. I'll catch you soon. All right, young lady. You take care of yourself now. It was a pleasure talking to you. Great to talk to you. Okay, bye-bye.